Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Little Dudes Insect Academy podcast. I'm here in Washington, D.C. at the ESA conference this year. Um, we're talking about bugs all week, so um, I'm across the table uh, from my new friend, Grace, and um, we're going to talk about bugs for a little bit with you guys. So welcome to the show, Grace. Go ahead and introduce yourself for us. Yeah, thank you for having me. My name is Grace Kolb. I'm currently a Ph.D. student um, at Purdue University focusing on medical entomology and urban entomology. Nice. Yeah. And we'll talk all about um, what all of that means in just a second. But let's go back to your schooling. Um, uh, Where did you go for all of that? And where are you in that process? And what were some of the things you've worked on so far? So for my undergrad, I was at Cornell University. My focus at that point was flies. Oh, nice. Coolest bugs ever. So basically mosquitoes, house flies, um, just the variety of flies that you'll see if you go out to your garden. Yeah. So at that point, I was working on, focusing on the medical side mostly. So mm-hmm. working in the Harrington lab, um, rearing mosquitoes. Nice. And then also in the insect collection, curating the fly collection. That way, when researchers contact us, we can get good specimens to show them mm-hmm. uh, and just sort of update everything because names have changed. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, so where are you right now? Well, so after Cornell, I ended up going to the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine okay. uh, for my master's, wow. which was in medical entomology for disease control. Okay. So not just the insects, but there was a huge emphasis on the parasites they spread, the diseases, mm. and how can we really, by controlling the insects, hopefully get a better handle on that and really start thinking about the end game to control some of these things, not just maintaining all of our programs that we have of bed nets or insecticides, but how could we really put an end to this once and for all? Mm, yeah, yeah. So how about um, after that? What are what are you doing now? Or is that what we, what you're doing now? So since then... Um, now you're at Purdue, right? Yeah, yeah so okay. now I'm at Purdue. And so I'm pivoting a little bit. Um, I didn't really want to be studying diseases or living in parts of the world uh, where I could catch some of those diseases. Right. So instead I'm pivoting back... back back to the United States, Mm -hmm. and I'm at Purdue studying a disease called delusional parasitosis. So this is a disorder where people believe their body is infested with insects, but there's no insects or parasites present. Mm, Wow. Yeah, that is crazy. I I personally didn't know that, um, that this even existed until I met you. Um, Super interesting. So tell us a little bit more about that. What, What is that all about? So the way it works is there's a very real symptoms. Mm -hmm. Um, It's called formication. It's when your skin sort of feels crawly or dry or sort of irritated, I guess. Mm -hmm. And a lot of health conditions can cause that. Different psychiatric conditions and even just physical conditions of vitamin deficiencies, drug interactions, different cancer, um, things like that can. But in these specific patients, they mistake the feeling and that sensation Instead of thinking it's just some health condition to see a doctor about, they believe it's actually caused by insects or parasites living in their skin. Mm. And so they're usually very resistant. They don't want to get medical help because they don't think it's a medical condition. Instead, they actually spend a lot of time calling insect people and pest control people trying to sort out what's going on. Yeah, so... What are some of the, I mean, I'm sure every case is different, right? But um, what are some of the solutions? Like, is this mostly a psychological disorder or are there, you know, you're an entomologist, right? So um, what are the um, solutions that you can provide sometimes? I'm sure they're all different, but like, just give us some examples of some of the um, solutions, if there are any to this. So the biggest thing that we as entomologists can do is rule out a pest infestation. Right. Because just because we don't see something right away doesn't mean that there's nothing there. Right. And it could be very hard to find, especially if it's bird mites or something kind of unusual. Yeah. So generally, people with the condition will actually collect uh, specimens of what they believe is causing their problems Mm. in what's called the specimen sign. And so they will bring boxes or baggies of debris or things like that to entomology departments or pest Mm -hmm. people. Um, So what our service we can provide at least is one, to listen to them, and then two, to look through those samples and to verify, yes, we don't see, you know, no eyes, no wings, no legs, you know, there's no insects or, you know, known pests in this sample. Mm. Um, We can't make any diagnosis, but what we could do is basically at least try to rule out an insect cause 
and hopefully prompt the person to get medical attention where their doctor would be able to see either by treating the underlying cause of the disease, could treat it and cure it, um, Mm -hmm. or occasionally antipsychotic medication would be used if they can't find an underlying cure. Wow. Yeah. So you mostly research these people in these conditions and then, um, you know, report on them and um, you do all these tests and then you consult them on it, right? Yes. Yeah, so for a lot of the time, we're sort of that first step. Yeah. Um, they're coming to us. We can at least say, well, it's not an insect. Mm-hmm. And hopefully we can prompt them to get further help. Mm-hmm. So a lot of our jobs, sort of that identification right. and lending a listening ear, because I always remind myself if I thought that I was infested or was suffering yeah. from that. Yeah. I would, you know, be willing to do anything to try to get treated. Right. And I wouldn't want someone just to brush me off. Of course. Because that is yeah. a very real concern. Yeah, and, and it's very um, it's very real to them, and so um, you need to kind of respect that. I totally, yeah, that I can, I can imagine that, yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, so w- what, like, percentage of the people that come to you are um, actually infested with, with insects versus not? Well, so there's really no insects that live on the human or in the human um, right. besides lice mm-hmm. or things like that. So for the most part, if patients are coming complaining, it's usually they're complaining that they're getting bitten or complaining that it's a pest, mm-hmm. like infesting them. Mm-hmm. Um, most of the time, there's no insect involved. I think yeah. my most recent research, we looked at 150 published medical cases, mm-hmm. and only 10 of them showed actual in- any insects at all. Wow. And in all of those cases, none of them were insects that would live on a human or infest a human. Right. Instead, it was things, you know, you'd maybe find in your windowsills or in the corner of your room. Or right. And those were the samples they had given you. Yeah, right. those were the samples. So it yeah. does seem, and most of the time, that's a small percentage. Most samples they give instead have things like dust, lint, hair, uh, skin debris or scabs, things like that. Yeah. So once again, it's sort of just mis- the feeling is real, the sensation, but they're just misattributing it to some sort of pests. Hmm. And sometimes looking at the debris or like a dust bunny under the microscope, there are little hairs or fibers that do seem to move just with the breeze of the air. Right. So it, I, it does make sense, you know, in a way that that could be a concern. Yeah. Although, luckily, that's, there's nothing that Often could actually not the case. invest yeah. us or make us sick. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So um, what originally got you interested in this, in entomology in general, and but then also this... Um, you know, these uh, insect interactions with humans. What originally got you into that? I would say insects, like everybody probably on your show, I've loved them since a little kid. Yeah. You know, going out to the garden and just looking under rocks instead of pulling weeds or doing anything helpful. Um, When I was around eight, I read a book called Parasites and People by Dr. Robert Desowitz, who was a parasitologist. Mm. And so he was talking about sort of the early ages of like the 1940s to 70s, what we were doing with neglected tropical diseases, Mm. which I thought was the coolest thing at the time. Right. And I believe in uh, fifth grade, I wrote a one-page school report on worms, and everyone in the class chose earthworms, but I did filarial worms. Nice. And I ended it with the classic sentence, I hope you don't get these worms. Yeah. Um, And then once I got a little bit older, when I was 11, I because I always wanted to do insects, but everyone was always saying, oh, it's just going to be a hobby. You won't be able to make a career out of it. Right. But I saw an entomologist on TV. Right. Dr. George McGavin. Okay. On this TV show, Expedition Borneo, where he was in the jungle catching all these cool, colorful bugs. And I Mm -hmm. actually wrote to him in England. Oh, really? And he wrote back and sent an autographed picture and was basically like, follow your dreams. Like, you can make a career out of this. That's awesome. And so basically that just set me off on the track of the parasites, people, medical side of things that's really carried me through my whole career so far. Yeah, that's that's really awesome. So um, are, do you ever, like, go to hospitals and stuff for this, or do you have, like, your own lab or remotely, or how does that all work? Um, so right now I'm in the, urban, the Center for Urban Entomology mm-hmm. at Purdue University. Right. So I don't go into hospital settings or doctor settings like mm-hmm. that. 
but these patients are usually very persistent with trying to get to the root cause of what's bothering them. Right. So they actually uh, very often will contact university entomology departments. Mm. And in fact, a lot of times if we don't give them the answer that they like, they'll then contact other entomology departments mm. and sort of keep doing that. Yeah. So we don't really have to go out and look. They seem to come to us. Yeah. However, medical doctors say the disorder is very, very rare. Because most patients, if I thought I was infested with insects, I wouldn't go to the doctor. I'd go to the pest people. Right. And that seems to be exactly what we observe. Mm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and so, um, you know, speaking of, like we were just talking about, um, you saw that entomologist on TV. Who, who are some other inspirational people that have kind of helped you along the way, whether you know them or not? Um, but yeah, who do you look up to with that? I would say I've had a couple entomologists come into my life at certain times that I've really needed it. Mm -hmm. Um, When I was younger, I had a great uncle, Ralph Pax, who was a professor at Michigan State studying insects and parasites. So at family get-togethers, I think from a young age, it was always never really talking to him about it, but just knowing like bugs and parasites are cool and they're out there and like people study them. Yeah. Then I'd say Dr. George McGavin was a big one. Okay. Um, because, yeah, that really set me off on this path. Yeah. Um, in the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine, I was able to uh, study under Joe Limes, who was uh, in charge of the WHO malaria section. Wow. For a while. So yeah. he was really good with kind of trying to think not just how are we going to keep doing what we're doing because it hasn't worked, but how can mm-hmm. we really pivot to hopefully ending some of these diseases. Right. And also Dr. Claire Rogers at the London School who runs the Parasite Diagnostic Lab Mm. um, in the UK. Yeah. And so she was really amazing with pulling up the microscope slides and in all those classes learning to, if I have a blood film, how do I know what parasite out of, you know, anything in the world is in it or same with a feces sample. Yeah. And it's like that kind of felt like a superpower almost. Yeah. Thanks to her and her teaching method was really, really amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, That's great to hear. And yeah, so we're here at ESA and there's a really, you know, a ton of amazing people here. Um, So what are you doing here? Like, uh, are you uh, teaching, like, are you uh, sitting in on any talks or um, yeah, what do you, are you just hanging out for the week or uh, what's going on here? Um, So a lot of it was hanging out for the week and basically getting a sense of what awesome research everyone's doing, especially in the medical veterinary urban section. Right. Um, I did give a talk uh, this morning about our most recent research on delusional parasitosis. Oh, wow. And pretty much that big case review we did. You know, what did we find? Because Mm -hmm. everything that's known so far about the disease is sort of anecdotal. It's well, I've seemed to notice this in the cases that have contacted us. Mm, This is what we seem to all be observing. But to really start getting to facts on the matter, yeah, um, we finally have a working group together for that. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so what have you found? Like, can you go into that a little bit here or, um, like how do we measure these kinds of things? Cause this is, um, kind of an abstract, you know, um, thing. So how do we measure something like that? Yeah, it's a little tricky studying the bugs that don't exist. Right, yeah, (laughs) Um, I can imagine. But basically, sort of some really cool things that we found. um, One is that patients are doctor hopping. So Mm. they'll go to multiple doctors within multiple specialties. Mm. And most doctors are not trained to recognize or diagnose or treat the disorder. Right. So that was an important takeaway. Um, We also realized, from the medical literature at least, Doctors don't really ask or have any idea what's going on with patients before mm-hmm. they walk in their door. Mm. So they're not asking, oh, have you looked into pest control? Have you talked to bug people? Um, and so patients are bringing specimens. You know, there's basically a big disconnect between entomology and then the medical side. Mm. Uh, so another interesting fact is that doctors are prescribing insecticidal treatments to patients, you know, just sort of assuming they have scabies or assuming they have lice even when they don't find any, Mm. Um, which can be dangerous because patients are often using those treatments themselves. Right. And several of the cases we reviewed, um, the individuals had either overdosed on ivermectin or different, uh, or at least were practicing very unsafe insecticide 
habits and behaviors. Because right. they want it to go away. Yeah. Exactly. But yeah. sometimes going overboard of taking baths in malathion or, you know, dangerous substances or wow. having things in contact with skin that shouldn't be right. for extended periods of time. So wow. I think it's important that doctors start to be aware of that. Yeah. And I think entomologists also, when we get these calls, that's maybe a question we need to be asking. Yeah. What are you doing to treat it or, you know, deal with this? Yeah. And then use it as an education opportunity. Yeah, for sure. That's that can be really important. Yeah. And the the implications of this are very um, obvious. Like this is obviously very important research to do um, as it affects, you know, people all over. Um, yeah, this is super fascinating. Um, yeah. So how many can you tell us how many, um, I guess, cases of this we find? Like how common is it? Well, so that's kind of one of the really big questions we don't know. Okay. The highest incidence that we've found um, in, re- in literature mm-hmm. is about 26 cases per 100,000 people. Okay. But other estimates range anything from like one case per one million people. Mm. So we have, doctors have no idea what's really going on. Mm. Um, so hopefully that's something we can sort of get a handle on because we do have the sense that most patients are not seeing medical treatment So they're not seeing the full scope of the issue. And Mm -hmm. from our review, we found that this occurs with people all around the world. Um, We had 28 different countries that we were able to find cases for. Wow. And it seems to affect people no matter what their education or uh, income level is. Hmm. So we have people who are medical doctors themselves or who are lawyers or, you know, very educated, well-off people who suffer from this. And also people in different countries or places who are very low income, you know, just trying to sort of sustain themselves who also can suffer from this, which seems to suggest that it is a physical, you know, and mental condition. It's not something that's, you know, we're just sort of nitpicky about, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And that's fascinating. Um, Have you, um, do you ever look at their personal experience or I guess traumas or anything with like their past, um, maybe as a child, maybe they had, I don't know, an experience with an insect that, that was negative or like they got bitten by a spider or something like that. Do you ever look at that kind of thing or uh, I'm just curious? Um, so it doesn't seem to be related to fear of insects Okay. at all, yeah. which is what some of the original research in the early like 1920s was looking at. Is this right. a type of phobia? Yeah. Instead, the patients, usually they're not bothered by insects instead Mm. it's just that persistent belief that they themselves have them right we have noticed that the disorder though seems to be tied to significant life events oh really so like divorce death of a spouse moving like significant stressors like that yeah um seem to be a very big like trigger for it Mm. and a lot of times the patients unlike a real pest infestation can tell you the day that it started of Oh. oh i noticed this happened this day where yeah. if you talk to people who have maybe a bed bug infestation in their home, it's like, I don't know. I saw the first one here, but I don't know where I got them from. So that right. seems to be something that might sort of tease them apart mm-hmm. um, that we're hoping to get some solid data on. Wow. Yeah, that is fascinating. Um, yeah, this is so interesting and bizarre. I never even thought about this. So this is great that you're on the show talking about it. But um, yeah, so uh, what are... Uh, Moving on, like, what are some other activities and hobbies that you enjoy uh, in your spare time, um, apart from school and apart from um, entomology and all of that? Well, I'd say with researching something that's sort of a psychological condition like this, having ways to relax is really, really useful. Mm -hmm. My biggest one would be um, probably going on nature walks or sitting outside, um, drawing like that. Uh, nature walks are really awesome, but usually it always seems you find a cool bug like just in the parking lot and, you know, Get next thing you know, yeah, you've only gone a little bit of the route, but yeah. had a wonderful time. So yeah. those are my main kind of ways to de-stress and just remember like the joy of bugs as well as talking to school groups. Yeah. Um, young kids is always a really refreshing, Yeah. you know, sort of life giving, I guess. That's awesome. Change. Yeah. Yeah. That's great to hear. Um. Yeah, so moving on to your future, um, what are you? What are, what are your plans? Um, what do you, what more research do you want to do? What are your big goals? Maybe trips you want to go on? Um, what are your big goals for the future? I would say research-wise, I would love to continue studying delusional parasitosis. Mm-hmm. I think that's always going to be sort of part of my research goal, 
um, just because nothing is known besides a couple individual published case reports. Yeah. So there's so much that we still need to figure out. Um, I would say I would love also, though, to pivot a lot more towards teaching. Nice. Either, like, and focusing on more that medical entomology parasite side. Yeah. So whether that's a med school or a university setting, um, I think I really love talking with students and educating on the really awesome, cool parasites out there. Yeah. And the cool insects that spread them. Yeah. Um, and then also hopefully having school visits be a component of that. Mm -hmm. because little children do get so excited and it always seems if you ever take a group of small kids like out to a field and give them all bug nets they always seem to catch the cool bugs that like you've been looking for and you've never been lucky enough and you know here a little five-year-old just brings it to you yes that's so exciting yeah Yeah. that is so awesome Mm -hmm. um anything else that you missed no, I don't think so. Just sharing the joy of insects because it yeah. doesn't matter what you want to study. Insects have you covered. If you're a chemistry person, we got you. Yeah. Physics, we have you. Yeah. Engineering, like, you know, we have all of these fields. Insects are a really awesome system. And yeah. pretty much if you can imagine an insect, it exists somewhere in the world. Yeah, which is just bizarre and crazy. Um, yeah, so um, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, this was really awesome. Um yeah, such a bizarre topic. Um, I've I've never interviewed anybody like this or heard of um, this before, so this was super cool, and I'm sure super awesome for the audience. Um, I think awareness is probably really important too, so that doctors can um, start, like you said earlier, um, start um, you know working this into a possibility because um, it happens. Um, yeah, thank you so much for being on the show. This was super awesome. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you for having me.